Oh, my goodness. I just, there are days that I just get overwhelmed by His presence uh, and just realise that God's better than you think. He's so much better than you think. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got to get my thoughts together. Um, I'm really excited about sharing this Word today because Pastor Henry sh- shared a phenomenal Word last week of from here to eternity. It's the theme, it's the, the heartbeat of how this year is gonna play out because I think for so many of us, I don't know how you've grown up, whether you didn't grow up in church, whether you did grow up in church, but we've kind of almost morphed into this reality that we just live for ourselves in this very individualistic Western culture. We live for ourselves, we live for today and we just hope for the best that we'll just get our ticket to heaven and you know, as long as we make it to Jesus, we're okay. But there's so much more about our faith. There's so much more about us being uh, born again believers that God has for us. For Scripture talks about the fact that He prepared in advance for us to do good works, to do things that actually shift people's lives. I, I don't think there's anything more satisfying in life than serving other people. When we live for ourselves, that's when it all gets screwed up. But the world wants us to live for me, myself and I right now. And if this culture blends into the church, we're going to be in a very dangerous position as the body of Christ. For God never wanted us to live individualistically. He wants us to live in family. He wants us to live as a body and He wants us to serve one another in love. Our life here on earth is not just the sum of zero to 80, 90 years and then we just go to heaven. In fact, some of this younger generation right now, Brenda was telling me that, you know, they were uh, in higher education in Seattle for over 20 years. And she said, you'd be amazed at how many university students do not believe that there is a heaven. What? They're like, oh, how can God either send people to heaven or send people to hell? Again, we've got a wrong understanding when we think God is there sending people to hell and sending people to heaven. That's actually not how it works. But that's how much we are an illiterate culture that doesn't even understand. But if we don't have eternity in mind, we're not going to live with focus. We're gonna aimlessly go through life, growing up, getting a degree, getting a job, getting married, having a few kids, putting some money in the bank and going on a few vacations and having some grandkids and oh, well, now it's time for me to go to heaven. There is so much more. And if you don't understand eternity, you will just live for all those things that I just talked to you, but it will actually be a very pointless life. If you've got to understand that there are rewards in heaven, there are rewards and what we do on this side of eternity matters for what we're going to be doing in eternity. We're not going to be little cherubs flying on harps with wings on a few clouds. If you think that's what heaven is, then you've really misunderstood God because when He placed Adam and Eve in the garden, He said, work, keep it, tend to it. He wants us to actually have dominion and authority. And what we're doing, you know, I grew up in a very AOG uh, church and I loved this statement. Now, obviously it's embedded in my heart and it's why I'm sold out to Jesus. But, you know, our pastor would always say, on this side of eternity, you're training for reigning. You're training for reigning in heaven. You're training for what you will be doing on the other side of eternity. There are positions and assignments and areas in heaven that we will be working with Jesus and what you do on earth matters. You're not just gonna die and then just be like sipping, you know, virgin pina coladas. (laughs) You're not gonna be doing that. We're actually gonna be achieving things. You know, when I was a little girl, I grew up, obviously went to school my whole life from kindergarten right through to year 12. And in Australia, we would have award ceremonies every single year. And I would get to the end of that year and I would, I would hope for an award and I never got one. 
I was so sad. Like I would leave awards every single year when all these other people are getting, you know, math distinctions and math competition. Even Pastor Henry won math competitions. He got awards and he failed school. (laughs) He only failed because he didn't apply himself. He's actually very smart. But he won awards. I didn't win any awards. And yet every year I would get to this awards at the end and I'd be like, really despondent. I would actually be praying before awards. God, give me a reward. You know, I think I deserve an award. I I showed up to school. I think I deserve an award. I did my homework. I, I think I deserve an award. But how many know that you only get an award when you surpass the average and become above average? And with that, there are studious children that actually apply themselves, do the work, do the test, do the extra extracurricular activities and therefore get awards. And yet every year at the end of those awards, I would go home going, you're gonna do better next year, Alex. Next year, you're gonna get an award. Well, of course, did I ever get that award? No, why? Because I went and did the exact same thing as I did the year before, nothing. I didn't apply myself, you know why? You, you might look at me and go, oh, you're so amazing. But I tell you, I would, uh, my year 12 exams, it was like final exams. And in Australia, they're like 70% of your mark. Like it is like really hard. And um, the night before all of my, I would look at my papers and I would know that I hadn't even tried during the year. And I would go to sleep and go, oh, well, I'll figure it out tomorrow. I was so disconnected that the next day I'd be, and then I'd be sweating bullets, like, oh my gosh, why didn't I study yesterday? This is really bad. Yesterday, by the way. (laughs) But then I wonder why I didn't get awards. And so many of us live like that in our Christian life. And I think we think that, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll get around to that next week. Or I'll figure that out when I'm a little bit older. And we actually don't realise, like Pastor Henry said last week, tomorrow is not promised. And what about if you were to have to face God today? Because there are rewards in heaven for each of us. Salvation is a gift And that means we will be with Jesus. But I don't wanna just come into heaven and realise that there is an award ceremony and I didn't get anything because number one, I didn't know that there were some crowns in heaven that await me. And also I just lived my life aimlessly doing the very bare minimum in my Christian life, hoping that I'll just scrape on in and have nothing to bring to my Saviour. And so I want us to unpack today the fact that we can be so focused about living on this side of eternity and be so driven to to get human accolade and human awards and, and be the best of the best on this side and actually forget that there is an eternity on the other side of our life. And if the average lifespan is about 80 years of age, 80 years compared to eternity is a blip. And I don't wanna spend eternity knowing that what I could have done in my 80 years could actually see a beautiful eternal reward. See, you may be busting your chops on this side of eternity to get your 401k to a place where you feel so comfortable and some of you might not even get there to enjoy it. Imagine that. Because we think, oh, I've got to save this. And if I accumulate all of this, and if I get this award, and if I'm this known, and and this is what we focus on, and this is what matters. Now, I'm not saying setting goals in your life and having things in your life is bad, I'm not. We've got to live our life and steward what we have well. But if there is no eternal purpose in it, if it's just for you, be careful because we're making things an idol that should be things that we get to steward. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We always talk about this Scripture around giving, but it's actually your life. And and God's saying, don't 
be busy just storing up treasures on earth where moth and rust and decay destroy it, where it can be stolen in a minute. It's not worth it when we go. It, nothing goes with us. But there is an eternal reward and I cannot wait to show you what that is. But we live in this culture where humanity loves to be validated. We love to be applauded. We love awards. It starts right from childhood. Oh, you did so good. Here, let me, re- we even get, give kids rewards to go party, which is very important because you want your kids to learn. But. Do you realise that we're always giving an award for good behaviour, for excelling, for doing well? And that actually can then translate in our lives like we've just got to focus on earthly things. We, we champion the hero. We strive for these trophies and physical awards that bring us accolade and notoriety, but we forget that our lives are so much more than just collecting statues and medals because our lives continue in eternity and what we do here on earth matters. Because when we first come to know Christ and enter this beautiful new kingdom mindset and realm, it's an opposite kingdom. Jesus doesn't care about what we care about. He says, what are you worried about tomorrow for? What are you worried about being dressed? I dress the lilies of the valley. What are you worried where your meal's going? You're worried about the wrong things. Everything's opposite in the Kingdom of God because Jesus understood where He came from. He understood the realm that we are gonna be living in. We're eternal beings. You realise that we were never meant to die. We were meant to be eternal beings reigning with Jesus and God and Holy Spirit. That we were meant to have dominion and authority and expand Eden to literally take over the earth. That was our mandate. Yet because of sin, now we've corrupted our mindset to think that we have to have dominion over each other. That we have to have power over each other, that one rises to the top so that we can push everybody down. But God never actually needed that from us. And yet we've got a worldly mindset that I need to be the best. I need to be, I need to be known. I need to be seen. I need to be validated. But when we receive salvation, you realise your salvation was about you for five minutes. It's freely you've received now, freely go and give it away. Go do something with the power and presence of God. Scripture describes our eternal rewards in terms of inheritance and responsibility. And Scripture will often talk about crowns uh, in heaven, crowns that we're gonna get, which actually relates to ruling authority. He talks about the disciples and how they will sit on judgment seats with Him and judge tribes. And there are things that when you overcome on this side of eternity, you get to do in eternity. You see, I want our church, I want you and I to live with eternity in mind, not just for the minute, not just for the temporal, not just for this validation that honestly lasts for five seconds. We put so much emphasis in what we wear, in how we look, in what schools we go to, in what jobs we get, in what houses we live, in what cars we drive, in what things that we accumulate so that it looks good for the now. But God says it's all temporal. Nothing is of eternal value. And I tell you, church, there's nothing more fulfilling than when you serve another person. I can't put my finger on it. Like even today, the sense that I got, the overwhelming sense that I got, that I said yes to Jesus now impacts generations of families was a a love hug from God that fulfilled me more than any husband, any child, any bank balance. Nothing compares to the feeling of when you've devoted your life for service for God and you see the fruit of it in front of your eyes. Nothing, nothing compares to it. Yet we get stuck in comparison. We get stuck in looking at what everybody has and we think we have not enough. And God says, get your eyes off. Because this culture wants immediate gratification. It wants everything now. Wants us to look good and also work for the least amount to get max financial reward. 
No one wants to do the mundane anymore. No one wants to actually stay the course. No one wants to be hidden. No one wants to be unseen. You may never get an earthly award this side of eternity, but you will receive crowns. Do you know that? You know, I said this in the earlier service, but there are certain people that raise their hands, they didn't even know that we get awarded crowns in heaven. You see, when you don't know what is on the other side, you won't live for anything. You'll just be aimless in your course of life because you actually don't really know that there is something that awaits you on the other side. See, the enemy has got us so tunnel visioned to live in for ourselves that we forget that there is gonna be eternity. And that eternity will come quicker than you realise. It's amazing to me how we just think that death's never gonna come at our door, but it does. It's inevitable. Every single one of us is going to die. Every single one of us is going to meet our Maker. Every one of us is gonna give an account to God. And that is not to put fear into you, that should excite you. Because in Christ, we can accomplish much. Now let's look at these five specific crowns mentioned in the Bible. The first crown is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 6, it says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. This is the Apostle Paul talking, uh, writing a letter to Timothy, his successor and saying, you know, my time's nearly ending and I've been, I've been working hard. He's obviously reflecting over his life and he's saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Can, can you assuredly say that before the Lord now? Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. The ones that have stayed the course and not deviated, knowing that the cause of their life has shifted from their self to the cause of Christ, to preach the Gospel, to lay hands on the sick, to bring as many people into eternity with them. But to live righteously, what does that mean? It's to conduct one's life in an upright manner with moral standards, but not out of your own striving. You see, I believe religion makes people self-righteous. And they think because they're doing all these right things that they are righteous. But have you ever been around a self-righteous person that makes you feel worse when you've left their presence? I have. I've gone, man, you're a real super spiro because you, know, you, you, you feel like you're better than me. See, that's self-righteousness. I think about Jesus who was perfect and without sin, yet sinners loved hanging around Him. The sinners never felt condemned. The sinners never felt judged. The sinners felt loved. And in fact, they transformed around Him. Why? Because even though He was the definition of perfect and without sin, He loved like the Father. There was no judgment in Him. There was pure love, but that love was so fierce that it caused change from people because they realised when Peter saw Him do that miracle at Galilee, he saw the power of Jesus and looked at himself and realised his humanity was so broken. See, what it does is it brings you to revelation of your need of Him, not condemnation that you need to move away from Him. And when we walk in righteousness, people around us are attracted to us. People around us want to know what is it that you have that I don't. You see, this righteousness is not a self-righteousness and so many Christians are self-righteous, I can't stand it. They think they're better than people. You're not better than anybody. You're only better because Jesus is in you. But just because Jesus is in you, it's not because of your works, it's because of what Christ did for you. And so that righteousness is a reflection of your absolute intimate relationship with Jesus. Not your stamp that I'm a Christian, because I've met a lot of people that call themselves Christians that act like Pharisees. As representatives of the Kingdom of God, In all that we do, we should should be imitating His ways. 
in the face of evil, doing what's right, not because we have to, but because we have such a fear of God that we don't wanna break His heart. That's righteousness. See, we were all made righteous in Christ, but that doesn't automatically cause you to walk in righteousness. You're made righteous, you're justified, just as if you've never sinned in God's eyes when you receive Christ as your Saviour. But now there's a sanctification process. And that sanctification process is a daily decision of, am I gonna do what Jesus does or am I gonna do what I wanna do? And this righteousness is of being of noble character, of carrying integrity, that when nobody else is watching, you you live like Jesus is sitting right next to you. So what you're doing in the history hidden places, there's a righteousness about you, there's a holiness in you that actually causes you to fight the good fight, to overcome temptation, to actually push through the flesh barrier that when you wanna give up, you keep staying the course. It's this kind of righteousness that Paul is saying, I have run the race, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race actually and I've done it being poured out like a drink offering, like a sacrifice unto God. Because you know what? I put myself as a living sacrifice because that's my reasonable act of worship. That's what He's talking about. Not just, oh, I'm a Christian, so I just get the righteousness crown because I entered into heaven. It's above and beyond. It's how you lived your Christian life. It's the integrity, it's the character, it's the perseverance. The bottom line is righteousness seeks to please God and obey Him rather than yourself at all times. And you can only do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can only do this when you're in Christ. You can only do it when you say, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. See, so many self-righteous Christians are doing it as works to earn God's favour. But beautiful, true righteousness is I have been so wrecked by God and made righteous when I am filthy and not worthy. But now because it's Christ that lives in me, now I can walk worthy of the calling on my life. Second one, incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Yeah, it would be weird if that gun went off and only one went. Everyone runs in a race, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. Yeah. And this is an incorruptible crown. This is the one that shows discipline in our walk with God. He's talking about, you see, in the Corinthian time society that they had like Olympic games. It was like an Olympic style event. And it was every other year. And with those games, they were like foot races and races. And Paul's using this as a metaphor. And he's saying it takes work to win the prize. He says about these athletes that literally punish their bodies. And we know that today we've got incredible athletes that go to the Olympics. We've got incredible athletes athletes that we revere as heroes, basketball, football, all these things. It was really funny. The other day I was watching the Super Bowl, very invested by the way, which is very unlike me. And I, and I said to Joel Oka, I said, um, I said, some of these football players look very unfit because they're very large. And I said, so how, how, if they're athletes, why do they look like they don't look like athletes? And he goes, you, you would have, he goes, they're meant to be big, Alex, for football, first of all, because they're the ones that literally are like the barriers. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then second of all, he goes, if you were to touch them, they're solid as a rock. And he goes, they are very athletic and they can, like, they can outrun and outsmart. And again, I'm very green with the whole football situation. So... <laughs> 
But what these guys do, and he used to train um, NFL players, they train morning, noon and night what they eat, how they sleep, every day in the gym. It takes effort to win a crown. It takes effort and discipline to be the best. You don't just show up and think that you're going to win by not practising. You don't show up like I did at every awards ceremony thinking that I'm gonna get an award when I haven't put in any work. And you would be amazed how many Christians do not read their Bible, do not sit in the secret place with the Lord and they wonder why they're not getting ahead. It's your discipline or lack of that actually causes you to win an incorruptible crown. What Paul is saying here, they do all this work for two years to be in one race that probably lasts four minutes to get a wreath that was made of pine that shrivels up about a week later. This wreath that gets placed on their head for a minute and everyone's like, woo! And then they go home and they're the same person. But what are we doing to discipline ourselves in our spiritual disciplines that will cause us to have an incorruptible crown that does not wither and die? It's the disciplines. It's the things you're doing when no one else is watching. It's the times where you choose to forfeit your friendships and go spend time with the Lord. It's the times when everybody else is doing the worldly stuff and you've chosen to go in and discipline your body, not in harshness like, oh, I must kill myself, but it's like I'm going in to surrender my, my you know, you wanna watch a Netflix show, but the prompting of the Holy Spirit is saying, why don't you just read a couple of chapters with me? And you ignore that. You see, it's about the discipline of your life and you will only get what you actually go after. And we, 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 we look at all of this and we are the most, it, like generation that gives us so much stuff and yet we're the most illiterate sometimes. But this undying crown or reward, it's not eternal life, the incorruptible crown, because no amount of self-denial or discipline or effort will earn God's salvation for you because Jesus earned that for us and it's a gift, but it's the reward for service unto Christ. Number three, the crown of life. This is known as the martyr's crown. I love it because it's the crown of life because you're prepared to die for it. Have you ever wondered why the disciples would just found it an honour to die for Jesus? They were living like Jesus was coming back next week. They were living every single day like we've got to expand the Gospel because Jesus could come back next week. You've got to understand they were with Him. They watched Him died and rise again in three days. And then He says, I'm coming back soon. So they probably thought, well, He died, rose again three days. This is gonna be short. So they lived like He was coming back today. They lived like if I don't see people saved, they lived with eternity in mind. They lived understanding that what Jesus did for them, He chose to die for them, so they chose to live for Him. And so this crown is Revelation 2.10 says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give your life as your victor's crown. James 1.12 said, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. I think about John, I think about the disciples when Jesus was actually saying, Boys, when you follow me, it's gonna cost your life. And it's an honour where Stephen was stoned to death and yet he wasn't cowering in fear. He was caught up in glory as they were stoning his physical body. Oh, they may have penetrated his physical being, but they could not get his spirit. And in fact, the glory of God shone from his face. That Saul, who then became Paul, watched as that 
killing was taking place. I cannot tell you how many times I've thought about that moment of watching Saul, who was a killer of Christians. Maybe that was the seed that began his salvation experience, a terrorist for Christians, that it was Stephen not cowering in fear, but caught up in the glory saying, it is my honour to die for the cause of Christ. Peter, saying, I am not worthy to die as my Saviour, so turn the cross upside down. John, who they put in a pot of boiling oil and they couldn't kill him. But God said, I need you to to go to the Isle of Patmos so that you're gonna reveal mysteries. It's gonna be written in my Word. Oh, decide when you die. And he died of old age. He finished his race, but they were all prepared to just die. Could we get out of our Western mentality that we're supposed to protect our lives? Can we get out of this fear-mongering atmosphere over the United States of America that we've got to be in defence all the time, protecting our religious liberties? Do you realise no one can take away your faith? No one can take away your power. No one can take away the saving grace in your life. No one! No one can tell me who to worship or not to worship. Do you realise that's a spiritual state? We've got to understand that I am so willing to stand before man and say, I serve Christ and Christ alone. You can take this body, but you cannot take this spirit. You will never be able to take the joy from me. Oh, you might put me in a prison. You might put me in something. You might, you might torture me, but you know what? The reward on the other side is the crown of life. What an honour. You just need to read Revelation. You need to read Pastor Darrell's Discipleship on the Edge. It'll make you wanna be a martyr for Jesus. Revelation always used to scare me, but it doesn't anymore. Number four, uh, number four, the crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown. First Thessalonians 2.19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Oh, the crown of rejoicing. Do you realise that when, when one person gets saved, it says that the, ho- all, the whole of heaven rejoices? There must be one massive party in heaven continually because there's seven, eight billion people on this planet and there are people getting saved every minute of every day. Have you ever thought about that? Heaven must be just rejoicing. Oh, another one! Another one, another one, another one, another one! (laughs) We just saw three or four here today. But how many churches are preaching the Gospel today? How many preachers, how many people are preaching the and and yet the heaven is rejoicing. You see, this is the crown of rejoicing. It's the soul winner's crown. There is nothing better that when you get to witness your faith and see somebody saved, it will stir your Christianity and you will get addicted to sharing your faith. I'm telling you, some of you are fearful of sharing your faith because you don't know that it's the power of the Gospel that transforms lives. Don't be ashamed of the Gospel of His Name because it's the power to transform lives. And if you just keep it to yourself, guess what? There's a, there's a Scripture in Proverbs 11.30 that says, the fruit of those who are right with God is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. If you want some wisdom in your life, start seeing some souls one. Because I'm telling you, God will start whispering into your heart, things that you need to answer those questions. See, some of you think that you don't have all the answers, so you stop witnessing. I feel this is from the Spirit of God. Some of you fear witnessing because you think, what about if they ask me a question about the Bible that I don't understand? Number one, you don't have to have all the answers. You can say, I can come back to you with that. But number two, don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit that in that minute, when I was a young girl, I would ask the Holy Spirit while someone's asking me the question that I actually freaked out and went, I don't know how to answer this. Holy Spirit, this is what I would say. Holy Spirit, give me the key. Give me the answer. Give me the key. You know all things. Speak to me right now. I would start answering what I knew to answer, but then something would take over and I would finish that conversation going, gosh, that was good. That clearly was not me. (laughs) Because it was a gift of wisdom. 
And God will give this to you because He cares about the person's salvation more than you do. And so don't be afraid. And this crown of rejoicing would be such a beautiful crown if the band could come. And the last crown is the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 2 to 4 says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And listen to this, guys. When the chief shepherd appears, that's Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. We all long for a sense of glory. Do you realise that you were actually designed for that? We, we sometimes get a bit like, oh, but it's not glory for ourselves. It's so that we can bring God glory, but there is something in all of us that needs to be great because God is not, not great. And so when we are revealing His glory, that's what it's all about. But you might think, but Pastor Alex, I'm not called to be a pastor or a shepherd. You really are. Each and every one of us are called to care and love one another. Each and every one of us are called to make disciples. Each and every one of us are called to be co-labourers with Christ. Some of us are co-group leaders in this place. Some of us are youth leaders. Some of us are young adult, good company leaders. Do you realise that you're shepherding the flock? And this is one of the greatest privileges that Jesus would liken us to Himself. Be a shepherd as I was the good shepherd. And as you do this, not because you have to, but because you choose to. Because you do it not for dishonest gain, not to lord over people, not to have power and dominion over people, because you genuinely love me. This is why when He said to Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, tend to my lambs, feed my sheep. Because it was the greatest honour to be a shepherd like Jesus was. And then He says, the crown of glory by the chief shepherd will be put on your head. That will never fade away. My husband, as he shared with you last week, I loved his message so much last week. If you didn't hear it, please go watch it. It's the theme and the vision for this year. But he talked about loving music and from the age of two, wanted to be a musician. He was really good and still is. And, um, you know, when he was young and 16, 17, 18, they were in a band. And in Australia, it was, you know, we have a small music industry, but they were kind of making strides in this grunge era. And um, he had a crazy band and he had crazy hair and he, he did amazing things. But they actually were about to get signed by a label because they'd won this battle of the bands and that people, the labels were scouting for new talent. And as they actually won that Battle of the Bands and they were being approached to be signed by a label, he radically gets saved at 19. And um, he's at a youth camp and he wrestles with God because God says, I, 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 want, I want your dream, Henry. Not because God is mean and cruel, but because God knew what He had for him. But He said, Henry, I need you to love me more than you love your gift. Because when I tell you my husband loves music, he eats, sleeps, drinks, wakes music. He is, it's, it's, it is an overflow of who he is. And yet this had become an idol in his life and he just didn't know it at the time, but he wrestled with God. It wasn't easy, but he laid down the desire for music and he thought he was gonna lay it down for the rest of his life. And he went and worked at a supermarket and he went and volunteered at church. And he talked about how he's just been stewarding his faithfulness his whole life. But then music got reintroduced through a way that he never actually thought it was gonna look. He never wanted to be a worship leader. He never wanted to be a worship guy. He just served. And then here we find him now, worship leading and writing songs and producing albums and engineering albums. And now he's working for artists all over the world. And he's 
His gift is just growing and growing. And then we come to America. And to be honest, guys, we didn't know what we were gonna do here. So he just said, well, I know how to mix records and I know how to write songs and I know how to sing. So I might just put my hand to developing and seeing what happens in the music industry here in Nashville. I was like, great, because I don't wanna work anymore. So you work and I'll sit at home. True story. (laughs) It didn't work out the way I planned, but that's okay. Um, But anyway, he starts mixing records and because that's what he knows to do and he was writing and doing all those sorts of things. And then obviously the basement happened and people started coming into our basement and we were pastoring. And uh, it got to a place about a year in when he was mixing records and he was shepherding people. And one day he was on a project and um, he had a deadline and one of our guys who was on the road, he was a bass player for a band and he was on the Bieber tour, world tour. And he was just struggling because he was out in the world and he was just like, I just miss the basement. I miss my community. Can you pray with me? And he just had to wrestle through some things. So there Henry is on the phone with him for about two hours, just pastoring him, just shepherding him. He gets off the phone and, and to himself, he's like, man, I just lost two hours of work and this is gonna mean I'm gonna have to work through the night. And it was right there that God asked him, hey, Henry, would you shepherd my flock? Would you pastor my people? And he's like, God, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I, I know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. And he said, I'm inviting you. You don't have to, but here's the invitation. And again, I watched my husband just lay down again his dream for music, lay down again his dream for all the things that maybe he had tied up in his heart. Because he said, at the end of the day, what You've done for me in my life, how can I live for myself when You died for me when You didn't have to? And he just laid that on the altar and he began to just serve faithfully as a shepherd, which he has done for the last 11 years. This is what I love about God. Because He put things in the right order, because He learned how to lay down what was precious to Him. This is why I don't believe having things and getting awards on this side of eternity is a bad thing. It's that if that is your only focus, that's where it gets bad. And so in the midst of him shepherding, he's just busy paying the bills really for our family. He's not thinking about Grammy Awards. He's not thinking about getting, you know, hobnobbing with people. He's just thinking about serving his family and serving the people that God's entrusted him with. And right smack in the middle of that, about a year into it, he mixes a project for this well-known artist and together they make this beautiful album and it gets nominated for a Grammy. And he gets the phone call and he's like, man, you've been nominated for a Grammy. He's like, what? I've had my head down shepherding people. I haven't been thinking about Grammys. And yet we went to the Grammys that year and um, I remember walking the red carpet with Henry and it was bedlam and it's chaotic. If you've ever been, it's people everywhere and it's media everywhere and it's everywhere. And I'm quite obviously a feeler and a discerning person. And I, as I'm walking, I'm, I'm thinking this is gonna be the best day. I was so excited to go because you know, I've grown up watching the Grammys every year of my life. And yet here I, we are on the red carpet and yet I'm grieved. I'm grieved because I can almost hear audibly cries from people saying, pick me, notice me. I wanna be number one, I wanna be the best. We watched as we were sitting in the Grammy auditorium when there would be awards and there was this people behind us, I don't even know who they were, but they didn't win the category that they were nominated for. And this guy starts cussing and so mad, he gets up, he walks out. I said, gosh, it really means something to people. And yet Henry wins this thing. Oh, don't, don't clap, don't clap. It's not the point. That's not the point, guys. But thank you, that's kind of you. But do you realise it's just the thing? It's just the thing. Once he got it, 
I'd like to accept this word. Thank you. Like you go, you go put it on a shelf. You never see it again. It doesn't change your life. In fact, we lost it. We moved houses and I couldn't find it. And if you understand the Recording Academy, when they send you this thing, you have to sign an affidavit that you will take care of, that you'll never sell it, that you won't give it away, that you will not put it on Facebook Marketplace, that you won't, you'll take care of it because it's so important. And yet we really did, I thought I lost it. I was like, we've lost the Grammy, love. (laughs) That it was shoved in a box in the garage somewhere where we started unloading, when we're doing a clean out, we found it. So now it sits in his studio where it should. But I want you to look at this. That's all very great. It's nice, it's a beautiful honour. But when Henry dies, he's gonna transition from this life to here. Now that gets left behind. That'll go to Holly or Taylor. And they'll just probably shove it on a shelf too because they don't really care about it. But then he'll get to heaven. Maybe he'll get one. Maybe you'll get two. Maybe you'll get three. Maybe you'll get four. Maybe we'll get five, I don't know. But the goal is not to be awarded crowns for our sake. Because Revelation 4, 9 says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sit on the throne and they worship Him who lived forever and ever and they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honour and power for You created all things and by Your will they were created and have their being. You see, when we get to heaven and He may award us the crown of life or the crown of righteousness or the crown of rejoicing or whatever that crown is, we're gonna just see Him, the one who wears many crowns, Revelation says, and we're gonna bow before Him and we're gonna lay our crowns before Him because we're gonna realise that when you're in the presence of Almighty God, the Lamb that was slain, that you're not worthy to be even in His presence. And He says, oh, that you would have a crown to give Him. I don't want to be in heaven with nothing to give my Saviour when He gave me His life. I don't want to get to heaven and think, oh my gosh, I wish I'd done more because I'm watching. Can you imagine that ceremony when every saint comes and just lays their crown before the the throne? There won't be condemnation in heaven. Oh, but there'll be a sense that we could have done more. Oh, there'll be a sense that we want to honour Him with our crown. And I want us as a church to not live for ourselves, but to live for a crown that never fades so that we can keep going to that throne room and saying, worthy, worthy are You. Right now with every head bowed, every eye closed, I think about Jesus who wore the crown before He walked to this earth and He exchanged His crown for a crown of thorns so that we could then receive His salvation so that we can reign with Him, be co-heirs with Him. And He was willing to lay down His own crown and take upon a crown of thorns that mocked Him and that was supposed to bring shame to Him. But oh, that we would rise up victors And I just feel like actually God wants to wreck some hearts today because there are some of you that have been living for the affirmation and accolade of man. And God's saying, I actually wanna change your heart. I felt actually in this service that they're gonna be young people, young adults that actually have these dreams that are, are good dreams, but you've got them in the wrong order. 
and I feel like you need to come and lay it at the altar like Henry did that day that he went to a field and threw his fist up at God asking, how could you ask me to lay this down? Not really understanding that God who is so good doesn't ask you to lay something down to torture you, but He asks you to lay things down so that you can actually get something of eternal reward. And meanwhile, He never ever forgets the desires of your heart. But why don't we stand to our feet? And if that's you right now, if this message has reverberated in your spirit, be obedient and come to the altar and just, we're gonna worship for a little bit. If you're saying, God, I wanna choose You. I don't wanna choose my will. I wanna choose Your will. I, wanna, I want my crowns to be eternal. I don't want them to be temporal. Come on, I know that there are men, that there are women, that there are older people, that there are young people. Don't be shy, this is good. This is actually such a release because I tell you, God's gonna start giving you eternal purpose attached to your dream, eternal rewards. Oh, there's gonna be a shift of angst. Some of you are riddled with anxiety. You're hustlers, you're people that literally, you're, just, you're so insecure that you think that the thing is gonna bring you your security. You think the thing is gonna bring you joy and happiness. But God is saying, I'm asking you to lay down your crown so that you can be crowned with glory, crowned with righteousness, crowned with life. And as the worship team begins to sing, I just want all of us in in the congregation to know that we're living for something greater than ourselves. Oh, respond to Jesus right now in Jesus' Name.